Third, we'll be hearing from Javier Morales, a long-time advocate for health equity and environmental justice. Uh, his work has enabled uh, community-led initiatives to address health equity issues and also to promote multi-sector approaches to prevent violence. Taking an expansive view of what constitutes health, Javier diligently works to enable opportunities for youth development, workforce development, college access, and supporting uh, prisoner re-entry, as well as immigration reform, early childhood development, affordable housing, and food security. Uh, Javier is originally from Sanger, California, and studied environmental sciences at UC Berkeley in city and regional planning at Cornell University. I'm really happy to be presenting on the panel with, uh, with Lori and Dr. Matson and, and Dr. Vicki Alexander. Um, you know, I've presented with Lori before across the country. Like I said this morning, all eyes are on Berkeley across the country. I was just in a meeting in Memphis to talk about different uh, uh, health initiatives and really all the, everyone, everyone was coming up and asking, How, how's Berkeley doing? You guys went? You guys went? How's San Francisco doing? So there's a lot of interest in what we're doing. Um, and people, people keep asking me, you know, when I'm not in groups like this, that, you know, why is it that you're so obsessed with the soda industry? Or why is it that you're so obsessed with getting people to shift consumption from, you know, full sugar uh, sweetened beverages to healthier options? And they're like, in the Latino community especially, don't you have paper worries? School dropout, unaccompanied minors, aren't those big worries for you? And, um, what, you know, that I'm so focused on, on sugar sweetened beverages and I'm working with many of you to try to reduce consumption, and, you know, they, and they assume that I'm some kind of, uh, you know, tree hugging. I wrote these down because I can never memorize the string. They assume that I'm some kind of anti-corporate, so little guy, tree hugging, gardening, local war, or what we call here around here a, a Berkeleyite. So, um, so, you know, I, for me, the issue of diabetes, it's an issue of social justice, and I'll, I'll make the argument. In, Probably about minute seven uh, of my ten minutes. Um, my title is actually required about needles and type 2 diabetes. And the reason for actually required is because you know we all get a lot of information all the time. But you know what what is it that we need to do to you know people need to prompt us to do something. I mean, my my email box I get 180 emails a day, but if it says actually required, I'll open that one first. So action required. You know we're we're at a very crucial point. Type 2 diabetes has reached epidemic-like proportions in the Latino community. I put epidemic-like uh, because there's the epidemic has a technical uh, uh, definition, uh, but I, could all, I would also argue that this has a pandemic-like uh, 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 proportion because this is not just something that's regional, it's actually going global now. Um, I, how many of you have an immediate family member that has diabetes? It's about, I'm looking around, it's about 40% of the people in here. That's about right, 40%. When I ask this question in, in, in uh, audiences of Latinos, 85 to 100% of the people raise their hands. And that's it. and I do these presentations across the state. It's 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 really it really is epidemic. Um, health consequences of obesity. So I'm going to run through the slides relatively quickly, and I'll stop on some really key ones. These are some things that have been covered by many of your other speakers, so I'm not going to spend too much time on them, but you know, type 2 diabetes is a consequence of obesity, amputations, blindness, heart disease, stroke, respiratory problems, and some cancers. Uh, and exactly what is type 2 diabetes? I don't know if anyone's actually given the clinical definition, but this is from the American Diabetes Association. It's a chronic illness that causes blood glucose levels to rise above normal. When you eat food, the body breaks down the sugars and starches into glucose. Insulin takes the sugar from the blood into the cells. For individuals with type 2 diabetes, either the body does not produce enough insulin or the cells ignore the insulin. So this is, this is the clinical definition, right? Yes, okay. I got a nod from the doctor. I'm a doctor too, but as my son and my family would remind you, I'm not a real doctor. 1995, diabetes. Uh, the darker the, the shape of the more diabetes that there is. 2000, 2005, 2010. So we just see it's just it's a trend. It's just getting uh, uh, more and more prevalent. Uh, it's quadrupled in the last uh, you know 20 years, 30 years. Youth and diabetes. Type 2 diabetes between 9, 10 and 19 year olds has increased 21 percent in between 2001, 2009. 
and that the incidence, incidence rate remain the same. The number of youth with type 2 diabetes in the U.S. is projected to increase by 49% over the next 40 years. Well, many of you have heard the statistic. The, the statistic we're using here in Berkeley is one in three children born since the year 2000 will get diabetes. For Latinos and African American children, it's one in two, 50%. Uh, if we do nothing about this, if we continue on the trajectory. Some more consequences of type 2 diabetes, blindness, amputations, insulin shot dependence, kidney failure, nerve damage. More, uh, there was a study recently done of all people that are hospitalized for any reason, like you go with a broken arm or for another reason, of all people who, have been, who are hospitalized in the state of California, 42.5% uh, of Latinos have diabetes. You can see that the number of African-American Indian, Alaska Native also have high numbers, African-Americans and Asian-Americans. I was on a panel with Ken Fujioka from the Scripps uh, uh, Weight Center down in uh, San Diego, and he said that Latinos, Native Americans, Pacific Islanders, and other indigenous groups, we have a genetic predisposition for diabetes. So, you know, when we talk about how much sugar we should be drinking, and, you know, some of us drink two or, you know, the threshold for, you know, uh, uh, gaining weight or getting diabetes, for Latinos and the other populations I mentioned, the threshold is much lower. So this is a quote that someone told me was overused. I, I don't think so because I think it just really resonates. We may not outlive, our, our children may not outlive us if we keep continuing at the rate that we're going with, especially with chronic diseases, especially diabetes. So why is it happening? Soda industry would say, you know, calories in, calories out. You're not exercising. It's personal choice. You, you know, you just need to exercise. We need to put exercise back into the schools. And, you know, there's research that's been done, plenty of research now that, that, that um, says, yes, we do need to exercise. But two, that sugar, sugar water is what we call it in South Carolina, in Berkeley. Sugar water um, is, is uniquely harmful for us. Also, there's the bio biological approach. There's the thrifty gene hypothesis in fat storage. It's just the population that I mentioned earlier. That's us. We have a many of us have a thrifty gene. You know, uh, fast and famine. When it's the time of fasting, uh, I mean famine, our body stores, and then you know, preparing for the famine period. But in our world today, the famine period never really comes, so we just keep accumulating. Um, the tendency to, to uh, again, same predisposition uh, to develop abdominal obesity amongst Latinos, a determinant of insulin resistance. Again, it's not just Latinos, it's the population I've mentioned. Um, so, but it's equally important to address the influence of physical <coughs> and social environments when we're, we're addressing type 2 diabetes. And when, I talk, when, when we talk about the causes of type 2 diabetes, I talked earlier about how it's a social justice issue. For, for when you go back to the environment, and you start to look at the places where people live. I've seen maps of diabetes, and I've seen maps of poverty, and they, they overlay pretty, they, they, they align. Um, and you know, I've also seen the same maps of incarceration rates. They also over, 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 they align as well. So for me, in the work that I do with the Latino Coalition for Health in California, a lot, for me, diabetes is an indicator of social injustice. Type 2 diabetes is an indicator of social justice, just like incarceration rates are. And when you start to get at the root of what causes these negative outcomes, you take a look at the environment. And these are, uh, there's a lot of research that's been done on the social determinants of health. And this is the name of our list. At least this is the way we named them. But there's a number of different lists. World Health Organization has a list. Uh, CDC has a list. Robert Wood Johnson has a list. There's a list. Everybody has a list. So this is kind of the list that we're working on. And basically what it is is the presence or absence of these different uh, uh, or different attributes in the community will either give or take away health. And so as public health advocates, we, for some reason, it's okay for us to go and work on increasing green space in parks. It's okay for us to go out and try to address food, food deserts by, by putting, you know, the, the, the work with the ecology centers with the, with the, with the, with the farm fresh, farm fresh choice, choice uh, uh, stands. Those are awesome, you know, putting these fresh fruit stands in communities that have food deserts. That's great work. 
We can work on housing, we can work on transportation, but for some reason, whenever we try to, whenever we start even to mention shifting consumption of sugary sweetened beverages, it's like the hammers drop, the gates go up, and, it, and we just, the, the, we, we're on our backs, we're defensive, just like, you know, right now, we're being outspent here in Berkeley. I don't know how many dollars to what, but I can tell you, we haven't even been able to respond to some of the mailers that have been out because we don't have money. So we're, be, we're being way out there. So why focus on sugary sweetened beverages? I'll only take two more minutes. Uh, there's been a clear link to the disease. There's, there's research after research, study after study, that shows that sugary sweetened beverages are a main driver of chronic disease and diabetes in the population of the Solid scientific evidence. Uh, one soda a day, over, overweight obesity risk goes up 55% in children. That's just one soda a day. Diabetes risk goes up 26%. Increased sugar sweetened beverage consumption contributed 130,000 new cases of diabetes and 14,000 new cases of heart disease. In 2010, sugar sweetened beverages were responsible for 25,000 deaths in the U.S. The, uh, another statistic here is you know, we've been at war in Iran and Afghanistan, Iraq and Afghanistan for I think it was 13 years. Yeah, we're going on our 13th year. And in those 13 years, uh, about 1,400 of our soldiers have come back with, with amputations, you know, war-related amputations. During that same period, 169,000 Californians had amputations due to diabetes. And if you're poor, the chance of you having to need an amputation was 10 times greater than if you were poor. I mean, it's uh, social justice. Juice drinks are everywhere, and we all know what sugary sweetened beverages are. Less commonly thought of the Haripos. We, we love the Haripo. Uh, my son, I just got him a Nantucket iced tea, Nantucket nectar iced tea yesterday. I'm like, I was looking at all the options. I was like, oh, that one looks healthy. 44 grams of sugar. <laughs> Not healthy. Main source of sugar. But I, I'm going to end on this. I'm sorry that this is the slide I end on. But, I'm to end on today. <laughs> but I just. It's, I, I was on an editorial, we went to go pitch an editorial panel, uh, down, uh, the Los Angeles News Group, on ha having them write a favorable editorial for us. We were trying to get the warning label bill passed. My organization was one of the co-sponsors on SB 1000 that died in Assembly Health this past session. Um, and uh, I was on a panel, well, uh, we went with a OBGYN, OBGYN, and what she said was that she hadn't seen a healthy liver in over 10 years because you know they have to do sonograms uh, to see how the child is, you know, in, in, in utero. And in ten years, she served mostly a medical client clientele. She said in over ten years, she hadn't seen a normal liver amongst her clientele and consumers. All of the, those. All, I don't know the point. What's the bottom? A healthy liver looks like that. It's kind of just red, deep red. You can't really tell because of the light. But if you look at the bottom, you can definitely see the fat marbling. And that, that is a huge driver of diabetes. And again, the genetic preponderance, uh, the uh, predisposition that we have as Latinos, the availability, over-availability of sugar, the targeted marketing that we talked about, it's all a perfect storm for the epidemic that we're seeing today.